it's, it's funny, isn't it, the walk that we go and the routes that we all take. That's why I say, you know, when we, when we look at somebody who hasn't come to Christ, and the temptation, if you are a born-again Christian, the temptation is to, is to, to you know, think some kind of judgment on them. And that's why I say a non-believer is just a saint who hasn't met Jesus yet. We're all at different stages, because heaven knows there were people who looked at me, you know, disapprovingly, and used words like reprobate and other things I can't spell <laughs> to describe me. And I just wasn't there yet. And same thing with others. And I see others coming along, and where they were a few years ago, and where they are now, a few years ago, they just weren't there yet. So we got to cut one another slack. Hey, if you've got a Bible, turn with me to the book of John. <clears throat> Excuse me. And let's see if my throat will survive through this one. Chapter 21 of the book of John. Gospel, that is to say. This is after Jesus has risen from the dead. He has shown himself a couple of times already to the disciples. And this time we're at the Sea of Tiberias. And there was Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee and the sons of Zebedee, the other two of his disciples. And Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we're going to go with you. And so they went off, they got into their boat. That night they caught nothing. So there's Jesus standing on the shore in the morning. The disciples didn't realize it was Jesus. And he said to them, sirs, have you caught anything? And they answered him, no. And he said to them, cast then out on the right side of the ship, and you shall find. And so they cast, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked, and did cast himself into the sea. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, as it were, two hundred cubits, that's about three hundred feet, dragging the net with fishes. And as soon as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid thereon and bread. And Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. And Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land, full of great fishes, a hundred and fifty-three. And for all there were so many, yet was the net not broken. <coughs> Jesus saith unto them, Come and dine. So here's good old Peter. And I've said before, he is the poster boy for dynamic action. And they've gone fishing. They're out there doing their thing. They've got this whole whack of fish that have come in in this net. And they see Jesus on the shore. And Jesus says, bring the fish in here. And Peter has got to do it to impress Jesus. He jumps overboard. I mean, he's already overboard. He grabs that net, and he's yarding it up, 153 great big old fish in that net, and he pulls it up onto the shore. And you look around, and Jesus is already there. He's got the fish on the fire. He just says, come and dine. Put that on a sticky note. Because we're going we're to think about that. At least we may not actually come back to it. But now turn with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 11, verses, well, we'll start at verse 28, right near the end. <clears throat> Jesus says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Labor. Come unto him, all ye who labor. Labor has got a connotation to it, a lot different from simply working. They talk about a woman who's going to have a baby, and you don't say that she's working on the baby. You don't say she's just pushing up the baby. She's in labor. And if you ever... Guys, some of us have been married, right? And some of us have kids, right? And we have heard what it can be like when a woman is in labor. <clears throat> some of it's not repeatable in church or anywhere else. But seriously, 
So I don't want to make light of that either. But it is labor. It is hard work. And the thing is that we tend to go through life laboring in some way. Bashing our head against a wall sometimes. You hit a wall and you, and you, you, you do things on your own hook. You're working hard. You're working your tail off. And you're not quite breaking through and you can't quite figure out what it is. You take on these burdens. You take on this, this yoke of the world. And you're banging yourself against a wall and something's just not happening. Amen? What's Jesus saying? Come to me if you are laboring. If you are banging your head against the wall. If you are pushing against something that is just not coming, excuse me, just not coming through. Come to me and I will give you rest. Doesn't mean you stop working. It doesn't mean there's no labor, sorry, it doesn't mean there's no burden involved. But he's saying my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Take my yoke upon you. That's, a, that's something that we have to do. We, we have to put it on. The Apostle Paul refers to putting on Christ. It's like you've got a brand new suit. You're changing your clothes. And you're putting that on. It's the same thing with Jesus' yoke. Take that on. In the book of Isaiah, I'll just flip back because I want to get the exact, the exact wording and it's quite important. Uh, this is Isaiah 10, 27. <clears throat> when, when, you, when you hear... Um, in that day, he's referring to the day of the Lord, when the Messiah has come, when the Lord is taking over the world. And Isaiah says, it shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulder. His refers to the enemy, the yoke, uh, the, um, the world. His yoke from off thy neck and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. In that day, the anointing, Christ, Christ means the anointing, amen? The anointing comes and it sits on you and in so doing, it shatters that yoke. It could never be put back together again. But it doesn't mean there's no yoke. And I'll get to that in a second. The yoke is necessary. But we replace that with an easier yoke and lighter burden. The burden of the world is so big. The burden of the world will tell us that we have to do things on our own. The burden of the world will tell us we have to do things in our own intellect. Our own intellect only carries us so far. We run into so much trouble because we, we think we can do it all on our own. Because the world has been saying, you've got to do it all on our own. The world gives reverence to the self-made man. And yet the thing is, there are people who can be so successful, they're not successful enough. Because they could go to a certain level but without that anointing, without Christ coming into your life, you, you, you don't get to the fullness of what God wants for you. I'm, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here. I want to focus on the thing about the yoke and the burden. The yoke is necessary. You got oxen yoked together. Because if you don't have them, the oxen are going to be going every which way, or they're going to stop, or they're going to sit down, or they're going to do something else, and they're not going to do you any good. Okay? The freedom, quote-unquote freedom, that we have if we don't take on Christ is no freedom at all. Because you're going all sorts of different directions, getting blown about by every wind, by, by your, own, your own feelings. You know, what, 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 what you feel... What you believe as a matter of conscience can change. You know, my, my, my beliefs and my conscience has changed. It's, it's different today than it was five years ago. It's different now than it was ten years ago. And it's going to be different five years from now. You know, that's my own personal belief. But God is ever the same. So the yoke keeps us going along the right track. We're always going to have a burden to carry. That's going to be the duty that God gives us. Whatever it is, it's going to be that burden that we carry. But with Jesus, the burden is light. And the yoke is easy. When you've got an easy yoke on you, you can move around. You can stretch. You can, you can look around at, at, at the scenery as you go down this path. But this time you're letting Jesus lead you. 
Bible says, lead me in the paths of righteousness. We, we don't want to try to find the path of righteousness ourselves because for us, righteousness just means what, what works for me right now. Amen? But what works for God is the same for all of us because he's no respecter of persons. So you stick with that. And you stick with this nice, easy yoke and this lighter burden, a lighter thing that he could ever have. Why on earth does the world keep trying to make it seem like it is such a freaking chore to be with Christ. It's hard. It's hard to walk the Christian walk. People say, no, 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 no. Drugs is hard. Lying is hard. Cheating is hard. Sexual sin is hard. <coughs> Getting yourself nailed to a cross for something you didn't do, that's hard. Amen? But Jesus' yoke is easy. And he wants to be easy. God wants it all to be easy for us because he loves us. People say, how can a loving God, you know, and then, and then they'll sort of fill in the blanks with that. <clears throat> but how could a loving God make it such an imperative for us to be with him and then put up barriers in front of us? He really doesn't. He sends his son to be our substitute on the cross as a sacrifice to wipe out our sins from the past that we can now move forward with our lives. So that makes it easy for us right there. And then his son says, take my yoke on you because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. In other words, don't, don't worry about what the world says. Find out what it's like. Take that step. Take that, you know, say yes, Lord. Take that step and move forward with me, he says. And see how easy it can be. See how much freedom you really do have. There's so much more freedom when you know the boundaries. And the boundaries God set are the same for all of us. And it's not hard, you see. But, you know, the world doesn't want us to come to God because the world is all mucked up with a whole bunch of other stuff, too. So we get ahead of that game and we, and we move forward in Christ because that's what God wants for us. Remember last week, if you were here, we were talking about, about Jesus washing the feet of the disciples and how that act of washing the feet is, is humble, it's humbling, it's servile, but it's also intimate. There is an intimacy that God wants with us. Jesus says, take my yoke on you and learn of me. When you learn of somebody, you get to know them. God said, in the fall of 2009, he said, this is going to be the year of knowledge. That's kind of been in a holding pattern. We need to get to know God. I mean, God knows us inside out, backwards, forwards. But as we get to know God, we get to know ourselves too. That kind of knowledge. Knowledge has that intimate Connotation. It's that it, there's a reason why knowing is used to describe the sex act, because it's a man and a woman together and having that knowledge, that total intimacy of each other. That's what God wants with us. If you look through it, you'll see so much. The relationship of God and man is described in terms of a marriage. You ever read the Song of Solomon? One of these days. One of these days I'll get up the cojones to actually study the Song of Solomon with us and go through it because it has been described as pure erotica. It, 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 it describes, I mean, it's like this great erotic love letter to King Solomon and Solomon writing back to whoever this is. But when you actually dissect it, you realize that this is what God wants for a relationship with his people. You talk about the bride of Christ. The heavenly city, the new Jerusalem, comes down as a bride adorned for her husband. The land is referred to as a she because we have to be her husband. I mean, that's the kind of knowledge that God wants. And he wants us to know him as intimately as possible so that he becomes one with us and we become one with him. That's a pretty darn good deal, if you ask me. And besides which, it's guaranteed to bring results. Now, when we labor, it's not like we're laboring. It's like we're, we're working. We're doing what we're supposed to do. We are now in the place where God wants us to be. You know, here's something else. 
we tend to go, when, when we make our decision about, yes, we're, we're going to do what God wants us to do, we tend to then go, you know, cudgeling our brains, going, what does God want me to do? What does God, hello, navel, I'm going to contemplate here. What does God want me to do? But actually, what it means is we turn towards God. We get to know him yes. through his word, through prayer, through those intimate conversations that we can have with him as we come to him through Jesus Christ. And that's the step. As we do that, he starts leading us. He starts putting us where he wants us to be. Sometimes it is miraculous. Things happen. Things happen you can't quite figure out. Why did I just get fired from my job? Okay, Lord, you got something else for me. All right, what's next? And then something else happens. You know, stuff like that starts to go down. The right people start to cross your path. You wind up walking into gospel mission. I mean, maybe something has happened that has brought you in here tonight of all nights. I remember that the first night, the first day, my wife Amelia went to West Point Christian Center. And there was a guy who gave the sermon that day who had not given the sermon in two years. And as the message unfolded, the tears started streaming down Amelia's face. This is a woman who had fallen so far away from God because she felt God had taken away her husband. And she was terrified walking into that church because she hadn't been into a church in so long. But she wanted to try again. And we left afterwards. We walked a couple of blocks away because she said, I, I, I just need to process this. And she stopped me about two blocks away and she said, why is it that that man gave that sermon in that church on that day when I walked in there? And there was a beating. She said, don't bother answering. I know the answer. <laughs> you see, this is, the, this is the miracle, amen? This is the miracle that happens is that you say, yes, Lord. You let him start to lead you. You start to get to know him without actually worrying about what's, you know, beyond the hill, beyond the hill, beyond the hill. But he starts taking you one step at a time and suddenly things start falling into place and you start going into that, that location where you are supposed to be. And then the light starts to fall into place. Now, there's still work to be done. It's still hard work. There's still a burden to carry because you're now caring about other people and other people, even, even because you are a child of God, even because you are in Christ, other people become your burden. Certainly a much easier burden to bear than your own burden because you are co-bearing that burden <coughs> of other people with all the other people who are around caring about those same people. And at the same time, your burden is now being picked up by a whole bunch of people who are praying for you. So you start to move forward. So once again, yeah, there's still a burden, there's still a yoke, there's still work to be done, but now you're on the right track. And that's what makes it all easy and light, is because now you know you are guaranteed results because it says so. And because you see that he is at work, you see the miracles that have fallen into place, the way that he has, 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 has started to lead you as you let him do it. And you don't have to worry about dragging all the fish to shore when all Jesus wants is for you to sit down and eat with him. Yeah. That's the other recurring theme in the Bible is eating, supping. Jesus is there with the fish on the fire and he says, come and dine. You don't have to worry about doing all the work. You don't have to impress him with that. You impress Jesus because you're breathing. Isn't that fabulous? It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what color your skin is. It doesn't matter where you've been in your life or what your parents did. Jesus says, come and dine. And if you're willing to come, man, he will in no way turn you out. He is banging on your door. He is saying, if any man comes to answer the door, I will come in. And what does he say he's going to do? Sup with him and he with me. That's an intimacy right there because you're sitting down, you're going for lunch, and you're sitting down and you're chatting. You know, there's something about sharing the meal like we're about to do in a couple of minutes. You know, sharing a meal, 
that, 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 that means that we've got that intimate time. And Jesus wants that time with us. God wants that time with us. He wants to make it so easy. He wants that intimacy. He wants to wash our feet. He wants to get to those, those dirtiest crevices that we can and do that cleaning up. Because if we try to do it ourselves, I mean, aside from tickling ourselves, some of us anyway, <coughs> we get down to the we get down to the dirtiest parts, but we miss a lot of it. But Jesus wants to get down on his hands and knees in front of us and just start working that out. And that's the same thing with, with the yoke. He wants to give us an easier yoke and a lighter burden. And he wants to take the yoke of the world, the thing that's been holding us back, the thing that has been dragging us right down into the pit, and smash that to pieces, it can never get put back together again. Amen? And that's what he is out to do. That's what God told Isaiah, you know, what, 2,700 years ago, whatever, that that was going to happen in that day, the day of the Lord, and we are in that day now. As we receive Christ, as we come to Christ, we accept that, and we say, I want that yoke taken off me, and I'll take yours instead. Amen? You know, we, we, we don't know the, 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 the day or the hour when Jesus is going to return, when suddenly it's out of time. But there's a lot of things going on that make you wonder, you know, how much more is going to happen. You know, what happened in Alabama, for crying out loud, 200 people like that, gone, with those 300 with those tornadoes. When I was down in Florida a couple of weeks ago, well, last week actually, when I was down there, and, and, and there, there were these sudden storms that just, you know, the finger of God just came down on, on the Carolinas and through Tennessee and, you know, just missed us to the north. You know? Makes you wonder what he's, you know, and, and Japan and New Zealand and Haiti. You know? And it makes you wonder what he's got cooked up for Vancouver. You know, this is a time, because, you know, how have we missed out on this? Is he trying to say, hey, have you got the message yet? Have you had enough yet? Are you coming yet? You know, now is our time that we need to draw closer to God. We need to be praying. We need to be saying, yes, Lord. We need to, sh to shed all those things that, that we have been scared of about turning away from the world and turn to Jesus. He's also given us something to relate to that is easy, and that is a man, a human being. God, yes, but in the form of a human being that we can look at and we can say, that's God. He's given us that to relate to. He's given us, you know, whatever we've gone through, he's gone through it too. Whatever temptations that we feel, he's felt them too. Paul says we don't, we don't have a high, a, a, an angel for a high priest who can't be touched by temptations. He says, we've got a high priest who knows what it's like. He's been there. Somebody knows the trouble we've seen. Somebody knows the sorrow. And that's Jesus. We've got that. So now is the time. Even to just take that first little baby step towards saying, okay, I, I, I want to know you. Come into my heart. If you haven't yet, now is a really good time. Feel free to come up, even as we're serving the meal. Feel free to come up and we'll pray together. We'll, 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 we'll do this. And invite the Holy Spirit into your heart. And be welcomed into the kingdom. Because this is a very real thing we're talking about. The results are real. Benefits are real. I'm not up to scare anybody. I don't want to do the shock and awe thing. I just want to say, you know, it's a time. And it doesn't matter how late you come to the party. God just says, come to the party. You know? Because the benefits are immediate and they just keep on growing. So, let's pray. Father, we, we thank you for the repeated reminders that you make it so easy for us to come to you. We thank you that you want us to be a part of you and you want to be a part of us. 
so much that you clear the way. You make the way straight. You, 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 you raise up the valleys to us. You keep a standard in front of us that we can look towards. And you give us an easy yoke and a light burden. Help us to remember that as we go through the things we have to go through today. Give us that courage to take those little steps towards you to say, I want to get to know you. I want to reach out to you. And Father, also for those of us who, who already know you, give us the courage to reach out to someone else and say, this is what I know. Say, come on in, the water's fine. To encourage people. To encourage people to look for something better. And to strive for that something better. Because it's available to all of us and it's right within our grasp. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.